afternoon or good morning, depending on where you are. And welcome to webinar five, the last in our series on remote teaching um, called Creating and Managing Your Learning Community. Um, I thought we would start with a little something musical. <laughs> Unfortunately, I'm not going to be able to play any music for you, but I thought that the analogy of a learning community as something as vast as we have on the screen with a choir, minimal orchestra, I've got a conductor. I thought that was quite um, reflective of the situation that we are conducting ourselves. So if you have a look at this image, there's a lot of people singing. There are a lot of people playing instruments. There is somebody who is making it all happen. There is a stage that somebody built in a building that somebody allowed them to use. Um, so we have examples of people who are actively participating and visibly so, and there are a lot of people in the background, shout out to my team, um, who are making it all happen. And the institutional structures that exist to allow us to do this in the first place. So all of those form part of our community and of the community that our learners are walking into when they start their courses with us. So what I would like to talk to you about today is the way that we are, the way that we are managing and, and orchestrating all of these different things for our students. So for the next almost an hour, uh, we're going to talk about learner communities, more specifically in the guise of uh, communities of inquiry. Um, we'll look at what e-moderating means within that context. And mostly I'm going to work through an example of a course that we delivered uh, this time, no, August last year, um, a course called STEM Start, which is a transition course uh, for school leavers coming to Cambridge starting STEM subjects. Um, and there are a lot of examples in that of best practice in forums, um, but also in the course as a whole. So we'll look at that in in through the lens of managing the community of that course. And it was huge. So um, there was plenty of management in it. And at the end, what I want to do is have a look at what your community is like um, and how you can build on what we've discussed throughout the series um, coming into through the summer for your preparation for next term and then how you survive and thrive next term and so do your students. OK, let's get going. OK, so this is an image of a student's support network. And um, if you're from Cambridge, the department section covers department and college. I know that's not exactly how it works here, but in terms of that entity of the university being the academic side of things. So we've got uh, lecturers who are doing large group teaching. We have tutors or undergraduate supervisors, college related, obviously, um, doing smaller group teaching. And then we've got demonstrators for labs and practicals. And there are a host of other roles in there as well. But academically, those are the people who are looking after our student. Obviously, the student also has access to the libraries, as do you. So making sure that the resources that you want to use in the coming term are all available online to check with your librarian. So those people are super important part of the support structure for the student and they provide training for students as well. And then we've got this support section where we've got disability resource support, we've got counselling services, we've got financial support, all of those are kind of always there. And then the help desk section has kind of exploded um, this this last term and the term coming because we're going online and the technical support is going to be so much bigger a part of the picture of the overall picture for each individual student. And that's all our institutional um, context. So what you're looking at with your students for supporting each individual, as we mentioned before, is effective. So their emotional and personal well-being, um, academic, how well they're getting on with the subject matter and the technical, which is born largely by help desk, but people are going to come to you with their queries first of all. But what we really want to talk about today is the the other part of your students communities, which is each other. OK, so we normally have students come into us. They meet during face to face lectures. They talk to each other. They walk out together. They talk about whether they understood it or not and whether they want to go for a coffee or to the bar afterwards. They have an instant connection that is easy and that is incidental to their being physically 
near each other. Um, when we're online, we need to make a little bit more effort uh, to make that happen. It's not something that automatically occurs. When this session finishes, we'll all click hang up and that'll be it. There won't be any people going to uh, the cafe for a chat about it afterwards. That's just the nature of how these sessions are run and how we are in contact or not in contact when we are distanced from each other. So for us, we need to put a certain amount of effort into making sure that students have that time together, either as a uh, kind of on task or off task. It's our job to facilitate that and it will be supported obviously by the technical part of your university and all of those things will still be there, but it's still it's up to it's up to us to make it happen. And it's an engine that requires a lot of revving, so it needs a lot of pushing down the hill to get it started. Um, but once it's started, it needs kind of some support as it goes. You can't just leave it or it will it'll uh, kind of grind to a halt again. So this is what we're what we're after today. And all of the stuff that we've talked about in the other webinars so far all contribute to this community. If you're delivering your sessions with lots of questions and getting people to talk to each other and to you, then you're already formulating that willingness to participate and that willingness to be part of the experience for you and for the other people. So it is a crucial part of it, but what we're looking at today is much more on the asynchronous side of things. So I'm assuming everyone has heard of communities of inquiry. Um, if you haven't, in the unlikely case that you haven't, um, there's a definition here from Athabasca, which is an edu educational community of inquiry is a group of individuals who are collaboratively who in collaboratively engage in purposeful critical discourse and reflection to construct personal meaning and confirm mutual understanding. So essentially it's a social constructivist model. So people are creating, they're constructing their own meaning and they're doing that together. So if you managed to get hold of the pre-session materials this week, um, congratulations because they only went out yesterday. Um, they, there's a lot more in that document to point you to more resources around that. Can I have a quick check in the chat of did anybody uh, manage to download those yet? OK, magic. Um, um, obviously, you've memorized them in, in their entirety already. Um, OK, Matt, we'll have a we'll have a look and send it, send it through to you. OK, so social constructivism is where it's at for for what we're talking about today. And the community of inquiry is based on this sense of presence, both it, well, not both, but in all three of the areas in the Venn diagram. So teaching, social and cognitive. There's no coincidence that teaching is on the top. But let's look at the other couple of things first. So socially, we're looking at developing a sense of belonging to the group. So at Cambridge, we have you get um, admitted to the university and then you get accepted to a college as well. So you're already accepted to a subset of the set that you wanted to be in. So there's, there is a certain sense of belonging that's already there, but we need to build on that, particularly if we're not going to be able to see people face to face as frequently as we have been in the past. And that's obviously not the case for other, um, other universities either. OK, we'll have a look into that for you, Jennifer. Um, with cognitive, presence, we're basically looking at bringing people's minds to the community, bringing people's minds to the activities that we are putting on offer for people. So what we need to create is outcomes driven, intellectually challenging tasks. So things that and the word tasks is carefully chosen too. So it's about making things for people to do, not consume. So we create content. A lot of content is consumed more than um, engaged with potentially. So this is our opportunity to fix the balance between passive and active here. So it could be a way of doing some of the surround sound that we talked about last week to your um, to your content. So if, if you were here last week, we talked about having your main piece of content and then having questions or tasks around that. And sometimes those tasks can lead straight into a live session and sometimes they can lead into an online discussion which takes place over the course of a week. But those tasks need to be intellectually challenging enough to draw the mind 
students in as well as the hearts by getting them to connect with each other. And the teaching presence part is a mixture of a whole lot of different things. And I'm going to show you how that works through an example. In the pre-session materials, there's, uh, again, there's signposts to a lot of documentation about the kind of the theoretical underpinnings of this. Uh, but I just want to show you a practical example of how it has worked recently in the past um, on a course that that I was involved with last year. So. So there's a lot on the screen here. Um, so this is on the top right is Dr. Lisa Jardine Wright, who is a lecturer in physics um, and she is she is the course lead for the STEM START program. So as I mentioned, it was a transition program for school leavers starting university to prepare them for university life, to get their maths and science up to scratch after a summer of not doing any maths and science practice at all. Um, and we used two different platforms to make that happen, which we thought might have been complicated for students, but actually turned out to be relatively simple. Um, it was more complicated for us than it was for them. Um, but the idea with this was there were a thousand students between uh, natural sciences and engineering and these examples are all taken from the natural sciences version which had 650 students in it so that is no small community and i hope that you don't have to um, do the same for any single one of your courses you may well have 650 students in total but not necessarily together so grouping which i mentioned in the pre-session materials and in and how to do it on your various platforms is really important because people can't connect with 649 other people it's just not possible you don't have time and you you run out of kind of you know enthusiasm fatigue um or kind of meeting new people that it's just too many so breaking them into smaller groups is a much better plan so in terms of being a present teacher you'll need to introduce your course and in the top right it's a welcome video from lisa telling them about what's what the course is about and what she found challenging from the beginning which is an instance of teacher presence here i am this is what i've provided for you and what i expect from you but also here's me as a person so when i first came to cambridge i found x challenging so it starts it gives the beginnings of her expectations of them and what they were prepared to give to her in terms of personal disclosure um but also makes her a human person which is a very nice thing to do especially online and especially with a university like Cambridge which can seem very lofty and unattainable and then you know, when students get here they feel very nervous because you know who are these amazing academics the more we can um the more we can present our humanity the better and that goes across the board with all universities everywhere so the very first thing is to introduce the course your presence is very clear in the structure of the course as well. You made or curated the content. You're going to create the activities around the content. You'll be the one leading any live sessions. It'll be your voice on any voiceovers or any videos or any demonstrations you want to do with physical objects. So um, all of those things, you will be present through the static content for sure. And then through each, like, each kind of high point of live engagement. But what we also need to make sure is that your presence, your active presence is felt even when they're working on their own. So what's happening in the in the bottom half of the screen is on the left hand side is a screenshot from a tutorial, which is a live session that uh, Lisa ran every week. Uh, and essentially the purpose of that was to go over all of the ideas that were tricky um, and the tricky ideas were identified through the data from the platform where they did their uh, did their maths and science practice and also from questions that were solicited from the students prior to the session. So in both of those, then when Lisa led her live session, she had loads of things to respond to that the students really wanted to know. So she was responding very clearly to them and to their work, what they had done and how they had done it and what they have self-confessed as being the thing that they need to hear about. So the, the teacher presence was felt in that she was monitoring, she was watching the data, she was watching activity, she saw what was going on and what was going on mattered. So I think that's where 
one of the difficulties lies with getting students to work online is they think it doesn't matter, doesn't matter. But if it is visible and clear that you care and that you've seen what they have done and that you're pleased with it, um, then it's much more, there's much more of a draw to get stuck into that kind of activity. So on the right hand side in the tutorials, um, we had the groups were split into their various colleges. So there was a lot of different groups and uh, we had a little competition, kind of light competition at the very beginning to see who would do the most posts um, and in the tutorial she congratulated the, the two colleges with the highest turnout and um, noted in particular great examples for in the forum and, and quoted them so again what you're doing online matters and responding to the students and their concerns because of their questions and because of the, the stuff that's in the data and then feeding back so she fed back on some of those things. I've seen some great examples and there have been others that she could then um, she could then point to as needing improvement without naming names or saying who it was and always saying things in a collective way rather than pointing out individuals. If you're going to name names, you name the ones who did really great posts. So Bob said that um, this was really important and it's absolutely a really big deal to do that. Thanks. Thanks for raising that, Bob. Um, so all of those things kind of come together as teacher presence, even through static, uh, static content that students are not necessarily doing that much with, but they have to respond to it in a certain way. And then it's on us to respond to what they're doing there. So one of the very first things, and this is, this is a big piece about social presence, sense of belonging, but also about teacher presence and setting expectations and tone was that we created this first activity, which was an icebreaker. And this is not, it's not rocket science. People do icebreakers all the time. You do them face to face. We do them online. And often when you go in an online course, there's a nice little paragraph about yourself. Say an unusual fact about you which is fine, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, but given that we were um, we were dealing with scientists and I had recently finished a course where I had done some user research with other scientists who were complaining about having to write essays when they had deliberately chosen science so as to not have to do any more writing, I thought, well, why don't we do this like this instead? And a mind map is a very valuable academic skill for report writing, for getting, for planning your research, for writing essays if you're doing biology. It, it is an important uh, academic skill. So it is something that we thought we thought was valuable, but also it's a little bit more fun and you get a bit more um, information into it without having to really think about how you're going to phrase it and present yourself. Because it's often, if you think back to the first webinar that we did, the first question is preparatory. It's literally just to start you thinking and talking um, but something like introducing yourself can be a really hard question how do I want to present myself how do I want to sound do I want to sound really clever do I want to sound really fun and approachable it, it's it can be quite a tricky um, a tricky one to approach so this mind map seemed like this was the answer so we gave it we gave it a go and this is not Lisa's one um, because it was a bit of a, a <laughs> data security risk, um, putting up something that was in a closed group so publicly. So we've made up a person, but an other is relatively realistic. Um, so things that are professional, things that are personal, things from your past, things that you are looking forward to in the future and finding out how we get on with those. So I'm going to show you the instructions for this task and they're quite long. So. I'm going to go through this section by section so that we see what is going on in the text that's on the side. So let's take a moment now to introduce ourselves. So we're breaking the ice and we're starting this socialization, social presence bit using a mind map. Take a look at my me map and then sketch your own. OK, so very simple. That's all that they have to do. Then there are uh, technical instructions to, of how to do it, share it with your peers by expanding the box. That whole paragraph is just about how you actually do that and you have to put that instruction in. Then in the next bit is phase two of that and to have a look at the me maps of your friends and see if you can find anything in common. If you do, say so. So we're asking them to respond to each other, overtly asking them for that response. 
you're grouped together with people in your college safety so you'll be working with people you will meet when you get here so we're setting up expectations for niceness and not trolling each other because you are going to meet in person eventually and you'll have to post something here before you can see what anyone else has written so that again is another psychologically safety psychological safety um, mechanism so it's a specific type of forum called a q a forum in moodle or it's just a setting on other platforms um, where you can't see anything unless you've posted something which essentially means that you have um you have to be brave enough to say something about yourself before you can read something about somebody else which also means that your work isn't going to be read by anyone who isn't brave enough to say something about themselves either. So there's a lot of um, emotional insurance built into that type of uh, forum activity. So of these, from these um, instructions, we got a really mixed response. Some people loved these. We got really good uh, response to uh, each other. Um, person to person. It also gave Lisa the opportunity to respond to individuals. Um, and then some people thought it was just a ridiculous activity. Why would we do that? It's so primary school. <laughs> and the reason is in the instructions. Can you have a look at the instructions and see if you can find what is missing that would have made this feel more um, cognitively challenging or cognitively appropriate? I'll give you a second. Yes, Maria, exactly. An explanation of why this is a useful skill and why they're doing it. Um, so part of why they're doing it is because they want to get to know each other and in preparation for that is, is part of that. So there's a little bit of that, but there's no cognitive reason for them to do that. So I explained to you at the beginning that we're working with scientists who potentially want to do more maths than writing, um, but we didn't say that there. We didn't say that we, we chose this specifically for this particular audience. Um, and we also didn't say that it's a really useful academic skill for preparing the academic writing that you do have to do. Your exam questions, your biology essays, your research dissertation. We didn't say that, but that is going into the next round of that. So getting your instructions right is really important. And Maria, yes, you do have to prepare this in advance. Um, you it's much easier if you prepare this in advance and then you can slot it in as your opening post um, rather than trying to react as you go. So everything that you do, as much of it as you can prepare in advance, the better so that you have more brain space and more time later on to respond to what's going on once once the term is um, is underway. So yes, we definitely need an explanation. So thinking back to teacher presence, and I know this is under the menus now. Um, so Lisa responded to someone else who uh, posted their map and was able to give them relevant information additional to what they would have been able to get from their peers. So it's a great archery society at Cambridge. Do you think you'll continue with that, etc.? So this is uh, it's a really nice way to respond to an individual. Uh, this one academic is not going to be able to respond to 650 students, but what she does have to do is exemplify in the beginning the kinds of responses that she wants from students. So this is very much a part of the kind of revving the engine in the beginning. It's like leading by example, showing people what it is that you expect, and then you can kind of uh, withdraw a little bit and let them do that together, which is exactly what happened in this group. So in the in the text so we've got that same person posted that she in her mind map that she liked badminton and then a couple of other people got back to her i also enjoy badminton but i'm not very good at it maybe we could play together so they're already wanting to build that community themselves they want to be part of it they want to arrive having friends and feeling that they are are connected in some way so this this 
builds, even though it was one activity, it built a lot of the different things. It built the teacher presence, it built social presence, and had we got our instructions right the first time, it would have built the cognitive presence as well. Um, but that will happen next time. So a little bit more on the social presence part as well. So we're connecting with individuals, not necessarily with the institution, but with individuals. And in the content, we also had these videos of existing students who talked about their experiences of coming to Cambridge and what it was like and how they felt about it. And they were all very generous with their um, what they said about themselves and how they felt about the different things. So even that helped, the content itself helped build that sense of social presence. So I know that if you're doing artificial intelligence or biology or archaeology, it's not as obvious where the social presence of the content is. But if you can tap into in any way people's previous experience, their interests, their ambitions, then it will help draw them in to being part of what you're kind of advertising to them as this kind of this new world where this content is important and these people are important. So there are a lot of different facets to it and a lot of overlap in between the various different things. Um, so just explore, um, even if it seems that it's not directly relevant straight away. Uncover, look at your learning outcomes, look at the different kinds of content that you have, think about how you might bring those things in and somewhere, somewhere there will be a possibility. You can't do it for everything and it wouldn't be appropriate to do it for everything, but it is possible in various places um, and it is nice to be able to do it too. It is very much appreciated by the students. So before we go to the cognitive presence part of the STEM Start program, I want to look at a different program entirely because there's a really amazing example of a cognitive presence plus social presence activity. Um, so this one here is social presence in discussion tasks. So this I found in a webinar run by Oxford University Press um, with Pam, with Pat, yes, I'm sorry, it was done in Moodle, uh, with Pam Gordon at Norwalk Community College doing art appreciation. And I recognise that's very far away, probably from what you're doing. Um, but if you have a look at these questions, so the, the piece of art that she's looking at is that kind of pile of candy in the in the on the left hand side. Um, and her questions are, what what does that piece of art mean? And to be able to answer that question, which is quite large, what is the form of the work and how can it change? That's very much content content. But then the two uh, questions in bold, what is your experience with terminal diseases? That's a huge question. And what is your experience with candy? Describe positive and negative aspects. So candy being a food, a food that is bad for you. We probably all eat too much of it and don't feel brilliant about it, whatever. But people have strong feelings about both of those things. And that first question, particularly now, would be very, uh, very punchy indeed. And you would need to know your students very well before you could ask something like that. But the context of that in LA in 1991, there's a huge AIDS crisis and it, the piece of work is very relevant to that. So the final question, what do you think the content of the work is based on form, context and your personal experience? So there's kind of almost factual, but not closed question plus personal questions and then putting the two together. So essentially you want to create social discussion tasks white that draw on personal experience so that nobody in the forum can turn around and go no <laughs> because nobody can say that that's not your experience with uh, terminal diseases or with candy. Nobody can take away your understanding of your own uh, experience. You can shape it together, but no one can say that you're wrong. So it's uh, it's just a very interesting multi-layered way of bringing all those things together, which is really, really nice. So. Um, Pam Gordon runs a completely online course. Um, I think she runs um, office hours type live sessions, but all of the content and all of the student interaction, student student interaction and all of her interaction with the students is mainly asynchronous. So, and this is a very successful example that was identified by Oxford University Press. So it's obviously something that is has quite a lot of value to um, to go forward and take into other other arenas. So coming back then to cognitive presence. So we have another task and again, apologies that it's so wordy, but all of the all of the text has different 
uh, different functions. So if we go through it um, piece by piece. So this was essentially a peer evaluation, peer review task. So supervisor role play. Every week in your real life when you come to university, you'll be asked to work through a set of problems or to write an essay or essay plan, which you will hand in before your supervisions or small group, uh, small group tutorials to be marked and then discussed in supervision. Context, that's pure context. To help you understand what supervisors or tutors are looking for, you're going to play the role of the supervisor and mark some work submitted by your students. So this is what you're doing, why you're doing it, and the context that it belongs in. And we had multiple choices here. So physical scientists work through these three submitted solution examples and mark them according to these criteria. So we had three large submissions that the students had to go through and uh, we assumed that it was going to take them about an hour and then obviously we gave them the criteria that they would have to have to work with. Then as you did for the analysis last week, try to come up with one comment about something in the submissions you reviewed that you saw had been done well, and this time two constructive suggestions for improvement. So this is indicative of the fact that we scaffolded their learning how to peer review. So we started off first with making them share in the first place with a low stakes question about themselves and there was no review there was comment oh how interesting you like badminton me too um but there was no comment on how well something had been done then the thing before this they had to comment on something that had been done well so building trust within the participants and giving them reassurance building their confidence and really pushing the social presence aspect of that. This time we're getting much more cerebral about it and thinking about something that has been done well and two constructive suggestions for improvement. So not two things that were rubbish, but two things that you can see can be improved and how you can see that. So thinking much more critically about what comes in, what you're looking at. Then the technical uh, technical instructions, post your comments, blah, blah, blah. And then the prompt to respond. Did your peers spot things you didn't? Do you agree with what they say? So this is their point where they need to go and talk to the other people, go back and respond in that same forum about the thing that they've looked at. And then there's a reflective question at the end. Um, does this change? What does this change? about the way that you write your own solutions. So what they'll see is the commonality of, uh, of mistakes that everybody makes, and then hopefully they'll fix those before they get corrected on those when they come to their own supervisions or tutorials at the time. So it is, it is quite a lot of text, but a lot of different things happen in that text, and there are a lot of different kinds of presence that are involved. So this is a, it was a very challenging task and it involved a very socially challenging task as well. Peer review is not easy for most people. Um, it involves a certain amount of bravery, but also a, a certain amount of sensitivity on the part of the person doing the reviewing and then giving the feedback and receiving feedback are skills that have to be developed. And certainly students that arrive at uh, 18 years of age are not really that well versed in doing those things. So they need practice and they need they need scaffolding. They need to be kind of nurtured into being able to do that. So that was again a very successful activity that the students enjoyed and did well and we got really good feedback on afterwards. So the forum type that um, that I mentioned in Moodle is called a Q&A. In Canvas, it's just a box you tick as to whether people can see other contributions before they can post their own. In general, would you think that is a good thing or a not so good thing? Answers in the chat box, please. Correct. Depends on the task, absolutely, yeah. And what might it depend on? What what would make it good or what is good about it? Yeah, you can't just mimic, absolutely. Yeah, so what it does is that it forces participation. If you want to see anybody else's answers, you have to answer yourself. You do reduce bias, absolutely. You don't, um, the ones who go first don't feel exposed. Yeah, that's really good, yeah. Um, but exactly, there's no model for students who might need support. So it prevents 
lurking and it forces participation. So lurking in this uh, context is when people kind of learn vicariously through the activities of others um, and they don't necessarily get the same benefit from being as active as they would do. And contribution contributions are not influenced by more confident voices. So we're removing the removing the bias and it, it builds trust because there's that there's no sense of exposure or being watched if you're the first one out and you know potentially doing something and um, not really not really knowing what you're doing and then you realize oh someone else did a much better one than me I should go and redo mine but I can't now it just takes takes all of that away so as their very first one it's quite a nice way to kind of introduce them into it but like you say there is no model for for support the other on the other side the other, the other half of the glass is that what happens is that it creates multiple threads rather than one thread. So um, because everyone is answering the initial question rather than coming in and participating in the discussion and building on the discussion, it, it kind of spiders out into lots of different threads. So you might get one, let's say two or three posts deep in each thread and it doesn't really go very far after that. It can become very repetitive because as people can't see what happened before, they can't respond to it. So it might be that there are 10 students in the group and all 10 of them say exactly the same thing, which is not very interesting for you as the instructor to have to read through, but also it doesn't really lead to anything particularly deep. So it, it materially affects the depth of the discussion. So the one about the the art and the kind of the terminal diseases and candy um, that you definitely wouldn't want that to be a Q&A forum um, because you want to be able to build and and make that discussion more challenging and much more meaty than is necessarily possible with Q&A option. And some people just miss out because they're too shy to say anything at all. So they can't uh, they can't access any of it. So there are again, it, there are pros and cons and depending on where you are if it's the very beginning and you want to make everybody feel very safe then go for it but if you do that then you have to provide a model yourself um, and Lisa did that by asking the students to create a me map but she did a me map first of all so the example was there so if they haven't seen a contributions from other students they need to see a contribution from you um, on the other hand you might want to get everybody really stuck into one discussion which might have multiple kind of tangential threads but there is one main direction or one maybe two main directions for the uh, for the discussion itself so there are options you can use both of them use them wisely that's all i have to say okay so if we're looking at good forum posts um not all Forum posts are created equal. Um, you need to you need to lead by example by doing a post that uh, that does promote discussion. So in the in the coloured boxes, we have various things that people might post. Can you tell me in the chat box which ones are appropriate in an academic discussion forum? That is cheating and there is no logic to the colour whatsoever because that would not be uh, very accessible for uh, people who can't see colour. So nice try people. <laughs> Word count is appropriate. It is an appropriate number, but it's not an appropriate thing to say. Yeah, would you agree, etc. I'm not sure I agree, lovely. Yeah, what do you have to say? What does everyone else think? I'm not sure. OK, so. Um, OK, yeah, so essentially you want to respond to people. It is a discussion after all. So the ones that are still there. Hi, everyone. Greet people. You're talking to people. You want to say hello. Would you agree? You're asking at the end of your post if people agree with what you have to say. And what does everyone else think is say the same thing? You just you're drawing in other questions and this is as valid for you as the facilitator as it is for the students so if the students post their their 
uh, their piece and it's about 250 words long. Brilliant. Um, they shouldn't say word count 250 because that's essay format, not forum post format. Um, but more or less, that sounds about right. Um, and then at the end, because it's a discussion, you want to know what people think. So do they agree with you? Do they not? And equally, as you start, if you're not the first person to post, then adapt your post to what has already gone on because nobody walks into a party and starts talking about the thing that they're interested in when it's a conversation already going so um yeah take if you take that analogy it makes it much simpler but if we have a look at the other ones good idea with the end that's not a forum post that's you know that's somebody clicking like on a on a facebook suggestion equally with nonsense we have to be nice to each other. Um, dear sir or madam is far too formal, but you do need to say hello. Um, and the last one, the, I'm so brilliant at this. No one actually says this, but they do. In uh, it's it's a it's an unfortunate situation, but the forums can be a place of showcasing where people just they don't really contribute to the discussion but they just talk about the great thing that they did and the other great thing that they read and this essay that I wrote and got a great mark for it's really unhelpful they they might even be making interesting points but because it's more about showcasing how great they are than it is about contributing and moving the discussion forward it's it's counterproductive and it's counterproductive also for social presence because it's off-putting is um people don't necessarily want to connect so much after that so remembering oh yes this is a great point so students from some cultural backgrounds may feel it very difficult not to abandon those yes exactly where deference to teacher is really important i agree and this is one of the reasons why we need to make it very clear that they're responding to the group, not responding to the teacher, because if they're responding to the teacher, it's uh, it's one to one. You have that deference problem um, and it can be it can be really hard. Um, yeah, it can definitely be really difficult to get them to argue with you. One of the things that is suggested is that you make people take a position um, so that they're not arguing their own thoughts. I mean, maybe the position you make them take is it does correspond to their own uh, their own opinion, but they're arguing something that you told them to argue. So it's kind of a way around the the deference issue. But it is it can be very difficult with um, certain social backgrounds. But I think in that situation, the more you structure it and the more um, the less choice almost you give them in what position they take and say they're being assessed on how well they can argue this point, then that that can that can help. It's not the absolute solution, but it can help. Um, anyway, you're generating a discussion and continuing it. Um, and another thing, if you have smiley face cards, so even if you put a proposition on the screen, even face to face, you hand out the cards and they it, smiley face agrees and a not smiley face disagrees. It's a it's a real it smooths over that situation really quickly. Anyway, a reason for listening. So if I'm responding to you, as Gemma was saying, blah, 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 um, Gemma has spotted her name. So oh, somebody's got something to say about what I said. This is cool. It, it generates that reason for listening. You and your task design have generated reason for listening anyway. But as you go through the conversation, you're generating it further and individuals are doing this. Students don't necessarily know how to do this, um, so they can sometimes need to be trained. As a teacher, with your starting posts and with your kind of encouraging posts, you're leading by example and showing tone, showing um, the depth of response, all of that stuff. Don't forget to say hello, ask a question always. Um, and what you're looking for is response to what's already there and building, moving the discussion forward. And if you're grading and you probably would, it's helpful to grade, then you're grading on what, how well they move the discussion forward, not how many words they write or whatever, how effective was what they said. And a typical helpful kind of rule of thumb is about two paragraphs. You don't want massive essays, you don't want single liners, but equally you don't want to put down 250 words exactly because that's what people will go for. And you're looking at uh, kind of quantitative response rather than qualitative. So around about two paragraphs. So give them all the support they require on that. But you want to support them, but equally you want to foster their independence. So can anybody tell me who this uh, guy on the left is? Can we shift some of the course grade online participation for the coming academic year in Cambridge? 
Um, I have no power over that, but that would be a brilliant idea. So I would fully support your proposal. Um, it is indeed Clark Kent. He's not Superman yet. Um, so Clark Kent on the left, um, how would you describe his character, Christopher Reeve? Yes, indeed, Andy. <laughs> how would you describe Clark Kent's character? If anybody can think back that far. Very mild. Yeah, quite shy, reserved, very awkward, timid and unassuming. Yes. So he's not that much of an independent learner, really. He requires instructions for everything. He is a cover up for Superman, yes, but his alter ego is is not the independent learner that you want in your group. So we need basically to create Superman out of Clark Kent and often students coming straight from school to university are much more Clark Kent than they are um, Superman. So it's part of part of the university experience is becoming this more um, kind of self-empowered, independent researcher, academic, professional. That's all, all the ways that we, we go. And part of the way, part of the way that we do this is through our forum activities and through the discussions is that we leave them a little bit to fend for themselves. Not so much, very, very supported, but they do need to fend for themselves a little bit and come up with stuff themselves. So in your discussions, don't step in every time someone asks a question. So if they've asked a question, leave it a day. Let it rest. Let other people have a look and see if they want to answer because you want to generate conversation between peers, not just between each individual and you. Invite responses from the group before you give the ultimate answer. So if within 24 hours nobody has said anything, ask them, you need to say something now. And then the last one is under my menu bar, state your time commitments if it's under your menu bar too. So your time, all of this takes a certain amount of time, but if you state the time commitment that you are prepared to make, um, then it makes it much clearer for the students what they can expect from you and how frequently they can expect to hear from you. Also, if you don't respond to their question, they're not going to feel like, oh, my teacher doesn't like me because they haven't answered my question. But they know that you're not going to be around for another 24 hours and that if somebody else jumps in and answers their question, that's wonderful. So that's the that's the, the ethos that we want to go for. And every now and then dip in and say hi, and make sure that they know you're there to support them. This is this is the big thing is Time is not infinite, not for you and not for your students either. So um, we have nine minutes left. So we'll just very quickly have a look at what happens in your forum over this, this time period. So you'll start at the beginning by posting with instructions. They'll have a couple of days to read, research, reflect on whatever resources you've asked them to, to think about. And then they'll have a deadline quite soon of their first post. And if they haven't, if they they haven't done anything, by day two, you might need to get in, remind and encourage, maybe add an extra resource or some, give some other reason for them to, to join in. After they've done their first post, you want to congratulate and encourage that. And if there are more than 20 posts, you might want to summarise at that point as well. Um, and then they've got time, got another couple of days to read and reflect on what's happened in the discussion and then another deadline to respond. So um, in the pre-session materials, uh, there is signposting to a couple of sets of uh, resources that have examples of tasks that you can adapt to your own context and a lot of them are like post this on this day and then two days later respond to two of your peers in these ways so you have a dead a first deadline and a second deadline so you need to kind of split it up and be very clear and consistent as well across the weeks of what you're expecting when and while that's happening, you're monitoring and taking notes, maybe encouraging, maybe drawing individuals into the conversation, maybe drawing everyone into the conversation by responding to a particularly interesting question. And then if that's going well, the conversation will continue, particularly if you're monitoring and taking notes and every now and then uh, bringing them in. And at the end, you want to summarise and congratulate again. So that's the that's the arc of how it goes. In your early weeks, this is going to take ages because nobody's going to know what they're doing and they're going to need a lot of support. As the course continues, this will take you a lot less time. So you still need to be present, but you can do that with much lighter touch as, as the course progresses. Um, 
so that's uh, and we could see that even in these webinars as well. The moderators were very busy in the first session and by the third session, everybody really um, the kind of regulars knew knew what you were doing, um, so didn't need quite so much help. This I'm going to leave for now there, but you'll be able to have a look at it uh, via the link on the bottom. So this is how you manage your interaction with students, what you need to do on a technical level and the kind of uh, facilitation function that you fulfill when you do engage. Um, and there's a lot of information about that on the Internet and it's it's a really good place to start if you're looking at doing these forum activities. It's a nice structure, it's a very sensible structure um, and it's been around for a while. So do do check that out. So just before we finish, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about your community. So forget students for now. We'll just we'll just concentrate on you. Um, so this is this is the last of these webinars. There's plenty of other supports out there in various places, and there's lots of stuff that I've signposted to through the other materials. And we'll make sure you get those afterwards if you didn't get them beforehand. But your big your big um, the key to your success really is the community that you belong to, and you belong to various levels of community as well. So on a personal level, you have the potential to do peer moderation with your uh, with your colleagues. So personally, you're talking about your, the colleagues in your immediate network and whether they're interested in doing the kinds of things that you're doing or if they're trying something else that you're interested in finding out about. So the peer moderation bit. So I have um, I'm very fortunate to have my colleagues who are here backing me up um, on the, the technical side of things and, and keeping everything going. Um, and if you're doing this for the first time, having somebody even one person to help you kind of partner on the very first time to open the door and mute microphones if that's necessary. Um, if that's a possibility for you, take it up. Um, it's not sustainable at all. You're not going to be able to do that for the whole term. Nobody is. But if you can each swap, so you do your first one moderated, that also gives way to that person, your moderator, observing your session. So you can while you're while you're busy talking, you can have them look at how much people are engaging, how interested they seem in a particular point, whether something is explained well for that particular medium. You've got lots of opportunities for feedback and growth in that, and that is a it's um, a very valuable way of going about your own uh, professional development in taking that opportunity. It's often tricky to to do logistically, but if you can make it work, it's really, really valuable. Locally, you've got whatever your institution provides and your subject specialists, including your librarians. Don't be limited to your subject. Um, don't be limited to your institution. Um, and you know, when we think about where innovation come from, comes from, it's very rarely from people who think exactly the same way as us. It often comes from things that are completely different or completely outside our normal sphere. Um, so think about including things. When you see a, a webinar that comes up about art appreciation, for example, go see what see what they have to say. It might well be the ideas that they use, not in their entirety, but there will be things that you can draw in and use in your context as well. Um, for your institution, if you're in Cambridge, there is a group on Yammer called the Remote Teaching, Learning and Assessment Group, um, and there's lots of stuff going on in there um, coming up over the summer. So do join that. Um, and globally, there are lots of options for you to do MOOCs and join uh, join communities. So there's the Association of Learning Technologists is uh, quite it's almost an obvious one. They they run lots of things. They have a blog. There's lots of things that you can follow and be part of. Learning Creative Learning is uh, it's an online course, but it is it is um, built mainly around the community. Um, Ed Surge and Future Teacher Talks again. They are talks or blogs that you can communicate with other people through. So have a look at those and there are again lots of other uh, places that I've signposted to through the materials that go along with these sessions that can be useful to you as you go forward um, and that can make the difference between you feeling a little bit flat or excited by a new idea and ready to take it forward and then take that back into your personal sphere where you try something out and get somebody to observe and they can watch more objectively than you can while you're busy experimenting um, and give you some good feedback on that um, at the end. Okay, 
thank you very much to everybody, particularly those of you who have been here since the beginning. Um, and a huge thank you to my colleagues, Emily, Jack, Shan, Jennifer and Michael, um, who've been running all of these sessions, uh, but you haven't gotten to see their faces. Um, good luck with all of this. If you are interested in uh, reviewing the uh, template course plan, do get in touch at Higher Education at cambridge.org and I'll be in touch in a couple of weeks to see if you've how you've gotten on with those. Um, brilliant. Okay. Thank you very much. Glad you enjoyed it and good luck for your course planning and for your teaching in the autumn. Take care.